this is the session to be at. So uh, we'll get started here momentarily, letting a few stragglers come up the escalator. Uh, anyway, my name is Kevin Krejci, and I'm the Business Development Alliance Manager at Fujitsu Labs and resident paparazzi photographer. Um, enough about me. I'm going to turn it over to our esteemed moderator, Jesus Molina, and he'll inter introduce the panels. Uh, and this panel session is Securing the Industrial Internet in the Age of IoT, which I'm sure you all know is, means Internet of Stuff. <laughs> Uh, Jesus Molina is a security consultant and a Fujitsu at Fujitsu Laboratories of America and a good friend of us here. And he will go ahead now and introduce the panelists. And then when he's done, I'll jump back up and give you a few more announcements. All right, Jesus, thank you. All right. Can you hear me? Oh, great. You are coming to come? It's free. <laughs> All right. So let's start. Um, So um, the panel is going to be the Securing the Industrial Internet. So um, my name is Jesus Molina. I am a consultant at uh, Fujitsu Laboratories. And also, I am the security person um, with the Industrial Internet Consortium. So I actually am the represent representative of Fujitsu at the Industrial Internet Consortium in the security field. So here our speakers are uh, Jonathan Meyer from Salford University. He's going to discuss the privacy aspects of the industrial internet. Um, um, Mosonobu Morinaga, which is uh, coming from Japan, and he is going to discuss uh, a specific implementation uh, to secure the, the Internet of Things. And finally, we have um, Avradip uh, Mandal, which is going to discuss uh, more the, the, the threats that the Internet of Things and the industrial Internet are going to bring. Um, so uh, those are our three speakers. So you can sit down. Um, so just to, to uh, uh, in the panel, I'm going to, every speaker are going to speak for a little bit, for five minutes, for the minutes. Then I will ask questions to them. And then, as we are small audiences, you also are free to ask any questions that you would like to have. Um, so okay, let's, let's go to the, with this. Like the industrial internet, the, the industrial um, internet, as you have, may have um, um, listened before, um, it's going to be the second industrial revolution. It's going to allow us to collect lots of data about lots of things and make decisions with them. So this is obviously going to provide a lot of good for us. It's going to uh, increase the performance uh, in the industry and everything. But also, it's going to open up the uh, surface attack uh, for the bad guys. So. Instead of like going for here to uh, start uh, discussing specific aspects, I'm going to bring a little bit of a story here, like uh, uh, a story of what it, this means, you know, in very concrete aspects. Um, I was, you know, for, for, for Christmas, I bought uh, a drone to my dad. Yeah, it's a drone, a very, very cheap drone. It's like a $50 drone. I'm very cheap. You know, so, you know, so I bought this $50 drone to my dad, and we start flying it. And of course, you know, because we didn't know how to fly this thing, it's a quadcopter, right? So we uh, stick it up into a palm tree. So it was like pff, stuck in the palm tree. So we recovered the drone, and uh, you know the drone. We started to fly it again, and it would fly, but it would fly only until here, right? So it was like like hovering here, but it still fly, you know, but fly here. So it was making this strange noise, you know. I was like, okay. So what? So my dad and me they constructed the drone, and finally found a little piece of dr of dirt in one of the rotors. We took it out, and sure enough the drone started flying perfectly again after we removed the dirt. But see what happened here. The drone was still flying, even if it has this piece of dirt in the rotor. And why was it still flying instead of like, like falling down? It's because inside it, there was like 500 signals every second telling the drone to secure itself. So every rotor was telling this other rotor, hey, stop. You're going too, too slow. All the others has to be the same, the same, the same velocity. This is like a 50 dollar drone. Imagine the possibilities if we have a train, which can like sense the temperature, can sense everything, and can uh, put the speed correctly. Imagine it can sense how many passengers there are. It can use the exact power necessary for this train to go. But now let's see the other thing. This drone was not listening to me anymore. I was telling him to go upper, and he was like, no, I'm hovering here, 
I'm not listening to you anymore because I don't want to. Because I am more responsible of this than you are. Now, uh, on Sunday, I was ha using a, a more expensive drone, a $500 drone of a friend of mine. And it's one of these parrots. So in order to connect with the drone, you see the wireless access point, the normal access point, you connect to it. And then you start using your parrot, you can see the video and everything. And that's great, you know, like, I don't have these clumsy controls, you know, I can use my thing. That's great too. But then I was like using it three times with different batteries and I was like, like flying it. And suddenly, my phone died. I was like, and then there was this, the, 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 the thing was like flying here, here, stuck here. And I cannot do anything with it. I don't have my phone, I cannot access it. I tried to move it and it not hurt me. It was moving it, trying to move it, like to push it. It didn't want to, it will be stuck here, exactly in the position. I could not interact with it anymore. And it occurred to me two things. Anybody that passed around with a phone and with this application could connect to this access point and now it will be his drone. He will fly it around <laughs> and I will never see it again. I'm like, okay. Not only this, before that anybody could listen what I was doing with the drone. This access point was not encrypted. So anybody could be seeing what I was videotaping, where my drone was going. So this is the industrial internet. It opens a lot of possibilities, but there is a lot of problems associated with it. People can listen to a lot of things. The privacy of your actions, you know, like, and again, anybody could have taken your things away now because these machines are going to listen more to the algorithms than to people. So with this, we're going to have like three um, uh, panels here which are like going to see different aspects of this. First, uh, we're going to go to Jonathan, which is going to discuss a little bit the privacy aspects of this, all this data collected that now maybe somebody's going to see, maybe not. So I'll give it to you. Sure. All right. Thanks. All right. Uh, so I'm going to try to cram, oops, I'm back. Uh, try to cram uh, American uh, privacy law into about five minutes. I'm going to do my best um, uh, with uh, the understanding, hopefully, that this is uh, very, very high level. Um, okay. Uh, okay, and uh, I have to give my usual disclaimer at this point. Right, not legal advice. Uh, and you know it's not legal advice because you'll be getting a bill afterwards if it, if it were. Um, okay, so let me start with uh, consumer data. Uh, just a quick sketch of how American law deals with it. Um, Unlike most Western countries, uh, the U.S. doesn't have a comprehensive electronic privacy law. Um, and so, uh, in general, when companies get on the hook uh, legally for uh, mishandling consumer data, it's because uh, they've done something that was deceptive. And specifically, they made some very clear mis uh, representation, and they breached that representation. Uh, or there was a deception by omission, the idea being that they did something that an ordinary user would want to know about and they failed to notify users. Um, so th th that's kind of the, the basics of American liability. Um, uh, and so the kind of punchline here, here is very straightforward. So long as you're honest and transparent with users, uh, your legal liability is much, much lesser. Um, in particular, the, the lead regulatory agency in the space is the Federal Trade Commission. And at the state level, their parallels are the state attorneys general. Um, so long as you're honest and transparent, it's a lot harder for them to bust you. So that's kind of the story on consumer data. As long as you're not lying, as long as you're not playing hide the ball, uh, so long as you can see me, you're not going to get caught. Now let me uh, flip over to the government side. Um, and the basic principle of American law uh, for, uh, oops, we lost it. There we go. Uh, for privacy against the government, uh, when a business holds data, is that if business has data, the government can get it. The question isn't if they can get it. The question is, what process does the government have to follow? And specifically, there are two ingredients, roughly, that are em uh, emphasized in American law. Uh, one is about how much evidence do you need before you can get your hands on the data. And then another is, does a judge decide whether there was enough evidence, or do law enforcement officers get to decide for themselves? Um, but, uh, so you've probably heard of a warrant, right? Warrant's a great example where the amount of evidence you need is uh, enough to establish probable cause and a judge has to decide. That's just one of many different procedures in American law. Um, uh, and so uh, for getting any specific data, 
the actual legal process that's required is uh, exceedingly complicated. Uh, there's constitutional law involved. The Fourth Amendment uh, protects privacy. Um, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act is the federal law. Uh, it uh, regulates law enforcement access. Uh, and uh, last but not least, you may have heard of FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, that's sort of the parallel for national security purposes. Um, so uh, the idea roughly here is that there's a sliding scale. A kind of the, the more sensitive data is, uh, the more it's the content of a communication or it's real time, there's going to be more evidence required and more judicial oversight. Uh, the more it's metadata, it's regular business records, it's not so sensitive, there's going to be less evidence required and less judicial oversight. Um, and the key takeaway for Internet of Things data, because of the way the statutes are structured and because of the way the constitutional doctrine has evolved, is in many, many circumstances, you don't need anything like a warrant. Uh, something like a subpoena, where law enforcement can show up with a piece of paper, is often sufficient to get their hands on data. Uh, so uh, let me give a concrete example uh, from uh, the appellate court that governs right here in California. Uh, so there was a, uh, a power company that had very fine-grained power records, kind of core Internet of Things uh, subject matter, right, power consumption, regulating it, mon uh, uh, monitoring it, and so on. So they, were, they had uh, a, a power system that allowed them to see very fine-grained details on uh, whether, um, uh, on how much power homes were using, uh, and so the DEA wised up and said, hey, we could probably find marijuana grow houses with that information. And so they showed up with uh, an administrative subpoena, a formal piece of paper, uh, and the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, the Court of Appeals that uh, governs out here, uh, said, that's okay. Um, so that, that Internet of Things data is available without a warrant. Uh, government can just show up and demand it. So this is a very concrete example of how the law does not provide a lot of protection in this area. Um, Okay, uh, the very last thing I'll say is a shameless plug. Uh, this is a complicated area of law. If you happen to want to know more about it, uh, Stanford offers a free online course. Um, so uh, it's on Coursera if you want to know more. Okay. All right, so our next speaker, Avradip, is going to discuss a little bit of, uh, of uh, the specific aspect of uh, threats for the in uh, uh, industrial internet. Okay, so here I'm going to discuss briefly about what do we immediately mean by industrial internet of things, and then we'll go about what kind of threats are there and what can we do to protect against them. So what is really industrial internet of things? It's basically a massive network of intelligent sensors. And it's everywhere. It's there today, and it will be, it will be there even more in, in future. For example, 50 years back, we have, the, we have all mechanical cars. They didn't have any single electronic sensors. And today, we have our cars has like hundreds of sensors. They are telling us, telling us various things. And in future, will be, the cars themselves will be communicating with each other. So this is going to improve our quality of life. And for example, we can prevent uh, human, human errors in hospitals will save lots of lives, and it, will, it can improve the efficiency in factory, factory, and various many things. But is everything good? No. So as we become ever more dependent, of, dependent on uh, our electro electronic devices, the, the surface, the, the, expo the attack surface is going to increase exponentially. The attackers will have access they can attack any point of any point in the whole network, and the whole network is, of course, is going to be secured as the weakest point of links. And in recent times, we have seen many such attacks. And one important point is over here is, before the threats were like virtual threats, we are losing information, but now the threats are going to be more and more physical threats. And in the, in the, we all know about the heartbeat. Heartbleed bug, bug. We, we are going to discuss about that in the next, ne, next slide. It, and the hospital ne network ha, has been hit with that. The attackers are, are um, stealing, ha, has, has stolen many information, uh, exploiting that bug. The, there is an ATM hacks, and 
the, the malwares at point of sales, which can st steal your credit card information, and so on. And we also know about the Sony data breach and consequences on that. So for the Hardwick Black bug, what exactly is that? So this is a, so this is a bug in the SSL uh, protocol. The SSL protocol is a protocol that is that has been used uh, to secure our uh, communication. And the bug allows the attacker to grab 64 kilobytes chunks of memory contents near the SSL heartbeat of, of, on a vulnerable host. And the attacker can access random chunks of data from the, the server. And the random chunk of the data can contain many in the sensitive information, like the pri private crypto keys, your passwords, or it, it can be anything else. And it, it affected the whole world. Multiple online services, including Amazon, GitHub, and many things else, they asked users to change, your, ch ch change their password. And so 4.5 4, 4 million patient data were stolen from one of the largest hospital operators. And 75 Cisco systems were affected, including IP phone systems, routers. And the main problem, so even though the bug was known, and then the quickly a patch was released, the main problem was you cannot really update your uh, internet of the small sensors uh, quick enough so that before the attackers, attackers are going to exploit that bug. So what can we really do in, in, in these kind of situations? So in any... When, so when we are, de we are de developing a system, so there, there is always a trade-off between security and utility. And many times what we do, we kind of, in our mind, we, we think about security at the last moment. The f first thing comes to our, our ma mind is how, how we can make the system so that it works robustly. And what happens in that process is our design, and the sec if the security comes in the last moment, then our design cannot be robust enough to handle all the secure threats. So what we really need to do is we need to change our mind frame. We need to think about the security first. The security should, should come at, at the first phase of the design. We need to, uh, when you are developing a software system, we need to think about the security first and everything else should come later. And also many, uh, among other things, what we can do is we need to analyze the systems well enough that, uh, so for example, if we make the, the, our protocol public, then everybody can know what's happening. On, on, on one hand, the attackers will know, but on the other hand, uh, the security com community can analyze how, how the system is. It is not, so we'll have a consens con consensus whether it's really secure or not. And another point about the is what we what Jonathan talked about. If we have data, that data can be can be hacked or leaked. So we shouldn't really collect more that more data than we, than than we need to. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Avradip. For the next speaker, Marina Gassan is going to uh, discuss um, a specific way, a preview implementation on how to prevent attacks in, inside networks. So please go ahead, Marina Gassan. Oops. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Chairman, for introduction. My name is Masano Morinaga from Fujitsu Laboratory in Japan. Today, I will talk about one of our technology which recently developed against cyber attack. First, let me give you the background. Uh, threat of cyber attack are widening recently, day by day, and so-called APT, uh, Advanced Persistent Threat, has become a serious issue. The APT is a highly sophisticated and persistent cyber attack, and it targets specific company or organizations, not randomly. And furthermore, the attack methods are getting very shrewder. That is to say, the new malware 
appears every day, often specific to t its target organization. And one of those malware is so-called RAT, Remote Access Trojan. The RAT is a malware which, the uh, which can be controlled by the attacker from outside of organization. And existing countermeasure can not cope with them. So under such a circumstance, we decide to develop new technology against cyber attack. And let me talk about a little more on how APT happened. Um, during APT, RAT is often used. And the typical step of APT is that first, the RAT introduces the intranet by avoiding cyber attack countermeasures, such as firewalls, such as uh, antivirus software, and so on. And the communication, oh, sorry. And the communication path to the outside is established. Once RAT introduced to the system, they repeat illegal access to the other nearby PCs, and they finally finish the confidential information. And these malware's communications are mixed in a large count of a large amount of normal communications. As such, the rat communication are difficult to detect. By the way, there are uh, existing measures, but they are not powerful enough against cyber attack. For example, uh, there are measures at gateway, such as IDS, IPS, firewall, such illegal communication outgoing, uh, they catch illegal communication. And uh, however, Malware communication is often encrypted, so which makes detection of malware difficult. And another uh, countermeasure is at endpoint, such as uh, antivirus software, sandbox detection. However, again, each rat is often customized to its target. So in this case, uh, which make detection of malware difficult again. And I notice you, uh, there are the segment where uh, effective measures are missing, which is intranet, internal network. So we develop new technology, which we call choke point monitoring. This is the new technology which overcomes difficulty of the malware detection. The core of this technology is its monitoring choke point and analyzing the context of intranet communication. Here, choke point is a series of steps common for most malware and which the attacker cannot do with that. For example, one of these choke point is that oh, illegal internal access packet are generated just after receiving interaction communication packet from the outside. Our technology cannot detect malware itself, but our technology Still can, uh, still can detect existence of malware by observing malware's behavior in the network. And this is an example of deployment of our technology. The monitoring device on which our technology implemented are distributed and deployed to each floor and administrator monitors them. 
actually our technology has already been commercialized. Our technology is implemented and used in INETFX Smart Finder, which is produced by PFU, a Facebook company. And we are demonstrating it at our booth and showing actual INETFX device. So please drop in our booth if you have a chance. Thank you for attention. Well, thank you very much. Um, now we're going to ask some questions to the panel, and then you know, it's every time around the questions, you are welcome to do, you know, like ask any questions. So I will ask one question to every panelist. The first question is going to be to, with to Jonathan. It's going to be about privacy, and uh, we know that uh, all this industrial internet requires a lot of data collection, right? You know, so a lot of new data is going to be shared between agencies and consumers. So can we talk a little bit about this type of data, new data is going to be shared and what kind of things, bad things opens up? Uh, sure. Um, uh, so on the, the consumer side, the uh, sort of privacy debates have focused on uh, location data, to be sure, um, and lifestyle data. Uh, uh, health monitoring systems are probably the best known example of that. Um, you know, the wrist watches, Fitbit, that sort of stuff. Um, um, uh, both of those, of course, have some duels uh, on the business side. Um, businesses, in turn, can uh, uh, leak out location data of their own. Um, and uh, while well, you know, personal lifestyle data might not be associated with business, information about uh, employee behaviors, uh, when folks are showing up, when, where they seem to be traveling, and so on, uh, can certainly leak out. Um, and in fact, there are whole companies now dedicated to recognizing that sort of um, secondary information is available from businesses uh, and using it as in a, uh, a business intelligence capacity. Um, uh, the, a kind of pre-Internet of Things version of that is um, there, there are quite a few startups now where their, their whole business model is they mo uh, monitor Facebook and Twitter and so on uh, for employees at companies talking about where the business might go um, and then using that to provide insight. Um, uh, that same sort of technology pointed at Internet of Things data makes all sorts of sense. Um, uh, as a sort of security duel, uh, I guess something to highlight that was in the news just this past week, um, uh, not quite location or lifestyle, but just an example of how uh, omnipresent sensors can um, really introduce some uh, security risks. Um, Samsung has started building microphones into its new TVs for voice control, makes sense. Um, but Samsung reserves the right to collect voice data um, somewhat arbitrarily from those TVs. Um, and it's kind of, they're blindingly clear uh, security and privacy issues for consumers and certainly for businesses too. You put a, a TV in the boardroom um, and it certainly is a quite exciting target. Um, okay, so that, that, those are some thoughts on the data that might be available. Um, um, in terms of what folks might do with it, I touched on business intelligence. Um, there are all sorts of more nefarious things that might be done with it. Um, location data, there have been some great examples of uh, some very sensitive inferences drawn from it. Um, uh, it's kind of very easy to find out, um, to give a kind of salacious instance, uh, uh, based on location history, when people have gone to uh, adult entertainment places or when they've gone to an, uh, uh, a competitor for an interview uh, or um, uh, when they've uh, perhaps gone to uh, some government agency to report on something or other. Um, it's, uh, it's very, very easy once you have the data to draw inferences like that. Um, so what could be done kind of sky's the limit um, and that makes it all sorts of clear this data needs to be protected. That sounds very scary, okay. <laughs> All right, so talking about the sky is the limit, you know, uh, a question for you, Everdeep. Um, you have talked about the Herbig bug, and I was pretty bad. Um, what's the biggest, like the one thing that, an attack that you can think that's super big, or like a big attack that you can think uh, with the Internet of Things open up? Yeah, so the Internet of Things opens up like a big attack surface. So, uh, so attacks are all, always there in uh, in past, but what's happening now is uh, the attack surface is really big. So anything can can 
can get hacked, and the uh, consequences will be devastating. So what has happened until now, I think if I have to pick one thing, I'll probably pick the uh, hardware bug itself. The mm -hmm. primary reason was the SSL, so it uh, kind of attacks the SSL uh, channel. And it, the, because of the bug, it, the whole, the, the, the data in the server becomes susceptible to the attacker. And one problem, even though the bug is pretty simple and the fix is also simple, the problem was there is this SSL stack is deployed everywhere. And it's kind of hard to fix every point. And so the, even though the bug is known, so now everybody knows the bug, bug is out there. And for, for, for example, you have, we have our home router. Uh, unless we can uh, upgrade the router with the new f firmware, it's completely vulnerable to the attacker. Yeah, so I think at present, I think the, so, so this bug was discovered probably now one year or almost, almost a year. But I, I'm pretty sure it's, there are millions of devices out there which are still susceptible to the bug. All right, Arit, thank you very much. Um, Marina Gassan, you discussed this uh, new technology. Uh, what's the biggest technical issue this technology presented to you? Oh, oh it, mm, it's a first implementation of detecting suspicious communication pattern. That is, our technology, choke point monitoring, need to be fast enough uh, in order for it to be applied to uh, the actual network. The issue is uh, computi computation time to find um, the correlation among the huge volume of uh, normal communication. So to deal, to deal the issue, we already, uh, we have already developed fast so algorithm to detect. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Um, going back to privacy, um, um, so how we can deal with it? Uh, all this like data, like it's going to be a store somewhere, um, all this data is transmitted in, we don't know how. How we can deal with uh, preserving privacy in the age of the Internet of Things? Um, uh, well, one option is certainly um, greater transparency and control. That's sort of the, uh, the kind of classic story is give people more notice, give people more choice. Um, there are tremendous limits to that, though. Um, uh, there's sort of an easy, it's easy to have information overload about uh, wh what information you're giving up and what you can do with it. Um, and so I think uh, uh, switching defaults is starting to look like a, a more effective response than um, just providing information and choice, rather uh, make people opt into giving information or give, make people opt into giving more granular information. Um, and there seems to be a trend, at least in some very sensitive applications towards that. Uh, case in point, Samsung made it very clear after this kerfuffle over their smart TV um, that they were going to uh, have some opt-in controls around uh, when their TV was going to be listening in. Um, so okay, that's kind of the, the choice structure side of things that I think offers some hope. Uh, then there are some purely technical solutions that I think offer some hope. Uh, there are ways in which you can deliver um, systems that uh, act upon um, uh, sensor data, that act upon um, uh, uh, sensitive data, uh, but without uh, necessarily compromising that data. There's kind of this uh, burgeoning field of um, uh, algorithms that accommodate both the privacy interest and all of the functionality you'd want. Um, and so there's certainly a, a great opportunity right now for businesses to take advantage of that. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, in the industrial internet, we're actually working on, on these kind of things of, of maybe blinding one field, you know, instead of like, so it still can be processed, you know, but so we are actually working on one of these, um, these new technologies. Um, so, so I've already, like, tell me, like, why, what, what, are, what is different with the inter Internet of Things in terms of security? What is, what it makes an Internet of Things um, different from the security perspective? Yeah, so, so the, so for, from a theoretical point of view, it's basically the same, right? 
So any computer system has some, uh, is susceptible to the attacks and so is Internet of Things. But um, what's actually happening is with the Internet of Things, we have vast amount of data, vast amount of, uh, 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 like we have millions of uh, sensors, anything can be hacked. And uh, so basically the degree of the attacks is, uh, the and the, what can happen due to those attacks that m much more, we have much more at stake. And so also for the attackers, they have now, the before it was like, they have no incentive to attack. So in the, so when we are not, we, we are not so dependent on the, in, in the electronic systems, so the attackers didn't have much in incentive. So they could have attacked your uh, email, they, will, they would have got some email, useless information, but now they can get your, banking password, uh, your, mm, so th th there is a bigger financial incentive. And in future, it's, it's probably the, the threats will be more. So instead of fi fi financial in incentive, the, the, we, we might be susceptible to f physical attacks. So I think, so the danger is much more than the, the, and than the previous era. I agree, <laughs> I agree. And it's different if like uh, an attacker can read your email, but if you can start like switching off your lights and stuff like this, you know, it gets a little bit Okay, not, not only that, and in the future you might die. <laughs> you, you never well, know. Well, that's true too, you uh, know, like. So there, there have been instances that uh, cars have been hacked. So if, if somebody hacks your car. Or your plane, yeah. 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 Makes so, right, that's kind of crazy. All right, so, um, so you, you talk about this, uh, this, um, um, uh, this quick detection engine, you know, like that, like checks out of packets in real time. Um, tell me about more about this technology, these algorithms you, you worked in. Okay. Uh, there are two, uh, there are two algorithms. Uh, one is uh, we call uh, specific domain diagnostic, which analyzes only specific part of the. Uh, which analyze a uh, specific part of packet and order of communication packet. And another is we call, uh, another one is we call uh, screening diagnostic, which uh, narrows down the candidate of packet to be analyzed. By these two algorithms, we uh, degrees computation time to detect. That's it. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, all right. So this is the rest. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'd just like to follow up on that. Does your technology work where, like, a, a device might not be within? Uh, does your technology work where device might not be within within a net uh, a corporate network? Yes. An example would be like a device at someone's home, but might be communicating with a corporate device. How about this? Our device is deployed uh, obvious network to support. Do you have a question? No, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, so as far as, okay, your algorithms, are they commercially available now? Are they researched? Uh, the question is uh, if the algorithms that he is deploying, are they commercially available? Are they just researched? Uh, this technology is uh, already available in product. So that is the uh, INET-6 smart finder, which produced by BFU. Already commercialized. So, so it's licensable. Licensable? I mean, how does the company... The question is, if the algorithm that you're using, detecting the packet, it is licensable? Can a, a third party license the technology from you? License technology oh, for other company? Yeah. Oh, uh, now I can uh, answer. It's a case by case, I think. Okay, but you're also a sales guy. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but I saw their, uh, you know, I went to their booth and they have a device which actually implements the technology. It's a box and inside they have the algorithms that uh, oh. verifies every packet. So it's, it's down there, you can see the, the net sec, right? So from, from PFU. Okay. Any questions for the audience? Any more? Go on.
so, uh, um, yeah, oh. the question is that about the, uh, you know, if, if the laws um, will be more better drafted in the European Commission, is that correct? Okay, so like the, the question is, um, it, it, when you create devices at the European Commission laws are much more stringent than the US laws, is it better to create, you know, to focus on the European law? Uh, so uh, my sense of where um, uh, legal practitioners have tried to guide businesses thus far has been a sort of two-track system. Uh, you have uh, your privacy processes in place for European customers and you've got your set of processes in place for American customers um, and uh, the European uh, processes are just more rigorous. Um, uh, when data moves between the two, uh, uh, there's a need to level up uh, or, or level down accordingly. Um, um, my understanding is businesses differ on uh, how much they level down from uh, uh, when Europeans travel in the US and they migrate data into a US data center. Um, uh, as for the, uh, the government access side of this, just to flag it since it's coming up right now in the courts, um, uh, the US Department of Justice has taken the position that they can reach into European subsidiaries and grab data. Um, uh, so uh, a bunch of companies tried to answer this business process problem by uh, uh, associating data for Europeans in, inside a European subsidiary. The idea being that that would allow them to comply with the European law and then they could keep American data separate. Uh, and the, the federal position has been um, if there is a, a, a parent entity that does a lot of business in the US, uh, they can uh, compel that parent entity to go reach down into the corporate subsidiary and grab user data. Um, and so it puts businesses in a very difficult position because they've gone out of their way to uh, honor the commitments the EU has asked them to make um, uh, and the federal government is uh, making it difficult to, to honor those commitments. All right, so I will ask a question to Avradip and uh, you know, basically it's a, a boilerplate of like, what can we do better to secure the industrial internet? What things we can can do in order to make this thing better? Yeah, so I think the more, most important thing is when we will be deploying a system, before deploying, we need to do a full-scale security analysis. And the problem is usually there is always a tension between the utility and the efficiency and the security. For example, we can uh, uh, use the most uh, state-of-the-art crypto system like homomorphic and fully homomorphic encryption, functional encryption, those things, but then they are not really efficient. So we might not be, so, so the point is, uh, at some point of time, we need to take a, we, we need to take a, draw a line and take a decision how much security we want and how much efficiency we want. And if you want to build a secure system, we, we, we need to, choose the efficiency, choose the security over efficiency. And another thing we should do is we, we should always assume something might fail. We might, we might think something is secure at, at today, but we, we might re realize in future that it is not secure anymore. And we should be ready at that point of time, we can apply a patch over th that small part of the system that the, then so such that the whole system becomes secure again. All right. Well, thank you, already. Um, uh, Marina Gassan, uh, you said, that y y you discussed here your technology. Is this enough um, uh, for, uh, to, to, to advance, to, to, find that, um, to fight advanced persistent threats, or do we need something else? What else do we need? Mm -hmm. uh, 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 we believe our technology is uh, effective and powerful. Uh, however, uh, it is the best combined with other solutions, uh, such as uh, firewall, uh, next generation firewall, or next generation endpoint protection, and so on. Uh, that, is, that is to say, uh, 
the defense in depth is important, we think. Okay. All right, so uh, going uh, back to privacy, uh, who's going to provide this privacy you discussed before? It's going to be, we know that, you know, we can have governments providing, but do you think the markets are going to provide this privacy or should the government step up and put some rules as we discussed before the European Union is doing? Um, uh, um, my sense in, in, in the consumer space uh, thus far, uh, market forces seem to have gone the other way. Um, there is uh, a tremendous business incentive to collect a lot of data. Um, uh, and, uh, and so at least for now, the trend seems to be in favor of collection and not necessarily towards um, uh, 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 privacy preserving systems that still offer a lot, a lot of functionality. Um, there are certain avenues of collecting data that um, and c certain sort of security and privacy risks that are starting to get shut down. Uh, I think a good example of that is uh, device encryption by default. Um, so, uh, so, so there are kind of little areas where the, the private sector is really stepping up to the plate. Um, but kind of the, the, the big open question of the coming decades is going to be, will, the U will or should the US start to look more like the EU on the books, uh, or should it continue to have uh, um, uh, something more of this uh, deception-based model. Uh, sort of, uh, it's up to you to make commitments, but if you make them, you're gonna have to be, uh, uh, you're gonna have to honor them. So, w w w but uh, in your opinion, where, who should, who do you think will be in charge, though, in your opinion? Um, I think uh, l uh, for certain discrete areas, it would make sense to invest uh, uh, federal regulators with uh, some amount of uh, authority. Um, so there's, there's certain um, areas, particularly sensitive areas, where it just makes all sorts of sense to have someone uh, with lead responsibility. A great example of that that was just in the news, this is an internet of things, but just to give an example of where I think uh, government preserving privacy could work well, um, is uh, uh, student data. Um, so ed tech companies uh, really are not looking so great right now on their security and privacy properties. And um, that's an area where um, uh, on the one hand, I certainly sympathize with the notion that there's all sorts of need for innovation in education. Um, but on the other hand, like what, what, more, what data needs to be protected more? Um, so uh, there's a place where I think it makes a lot of sense to have some federal regulators that have some greater authority. Yeah, I, I, I kind of agree with that. <laughs> all right, so we have more, three more minutes. Um, so I open the, the floor for questions from the audience. Um, Please, it's your time to, to, to have any questions you want about privacy, about uh, what we have discussed. No questions from the audience? Okay. <laughs> then I'll, 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 there you go. Yeah. Um, in looking at industrial IoT, you're looking at you have a distributed environment. You might have sensors and processes in an office environment. It could be construction machinery at a... Um, you know, an off-site location with a just a small, maybe um, you know, two G, two and a half G connection. It seems like it's trying to design um, security for that is a very difficult position. Is there any sorts of technologies that you can that you can look at that you would recommend for when you're doing such distributed types of endpoints and networks? Um, yeah. Already. So yeah, so it's true that uh, if we have uh, a distributed uh, network, so designing a secure system becomes more difficult. But uh, probably, but theoretically, it's not impossible because uh, if we can, if we, I think the mo most important part is how we can. We need to think about at from the design phase. So. If we can yeah, design a system who, 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 such that every block will be secure, then I think we can, we can make a kind of a, a combined system which will be in the end secure. So I think it all depends on what really we want the utility of it. Like, so some, it's again that question about how much utility we want and how much security we want. All right, so uh, 
just uh, to close in remarks here, um, you know, it's a minute off. Um, uh, we in Fujitsu is taking uh, the industrial internet very seriously. As again, we are part of the industrial internet consortium. I we're drafting uh, one of the rules. And um, going back to my little drone anecdote, yeah, imagine what could happen if that, that happens to a train, right? You know, and trains and all these devices and cars in 10 years will be self-driven. Trains will be self-driven. So we need, really need to protect um, our infrastructures right now because um, these industrial uh, locations were totally separate before, and now they will be absolutely connected. So from totally separated to absolutely connected, there is a huge gap, and we need to bridge this gap also in security if we need to be safe. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you for our panelists. Please give them a big hand. All right, Jesus, thank you very much, and thank you, panelists, and thank you, audience.